If you've got your Bibles with you, go ahead and open them up to the end of the book of 1 Peter. And yes, I mean the very end. Chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, the last three verses of the letter. This is a pretty momentous day. We have been in this letter for a long time. We started right after New Year's Day, and here we are, 4th of July weekend. We're wrapping things up. Glad you guys are all here. But we cannot really slow down quite yet because we've still got these three verses to deal with today. And to be honest with you, I I had some trouble with this little passage here when I first started studying for this morning. And it wasn't because this passage was too complicated. It was actually because this passage just seemed too simple. Let me just read it to you now. I'll, I'll, I'll let you see if you see what I mean. Here we go. 1 Peter 5, verses 12 through 14. This is what Peter writes. He says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greeting, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So, so pretty much these verses right here are Peter's way of saying goodbye. You know, he's, he's already written these five meaty chapters full of, of doctrine and instructions and these beautiful word pictures and all that stuff. And then right here he pretty much says, well, that's that. See you guys later. You know, Ro- Roman culture, they had this, this format that you followed when you were wrapping up a letter at this time. And Peter pretty much follows that format here. He, you know, you mentioned the person who's going to deliver the letter for you. You confirmed the truthfulness of the letter. You gave personal greetings from the people associated with you while you were writing the letter. And then you close it all with good wishes for the people you're writing to. Peter's got all those in these verses here. He fits the format to a T. You know, if you wanted to paraphrase this in, in modern English, you could say something like, well, hope you get this soon. Best wishes from my family to your family. See you soon, Peter. You know, nothing to see here, folks. Just move along. Just a straightforward, polite, conventional ending to a letter like you'd find in any letter at this time. Or is it? You see, that's the, the question that I found myself wrestling with as I studied this passage is, when is an ending to a letter more than just an ending to a letter? You know what I'm saying here? Because there are definitely times when a polite ending to a letter, it's, it's just that, a polite ending, saying goodbye, don't read anything else into it. But there are also times when a polite ending is much, much more. For example, I hold in my hand right here a piece of correspondence from the year 2004. This is a postcard that I wrote to my wife during the summer just before our sophomore year of high school. So, no, we weren't married yet. We weren't even dating yet, but as some of you youngsters out there would say today, I was totes crushing on her. So, for, for you adults, um, what that means is I was starting to develop strong feelings of affection for the young lady, and I began to suspect that these feelings were mutual. We talked on the phone from time to time. We had signed up for a bunch of the same classes in the, fo- in the upcoming fall, Like, I I had a good feeling about where things were going here. Anyway, my family was taking this road trip down to California. We stopped to spend the night in Bandon, Oregon. Lovely place, right on the beach, if you've ever been there. And I wrote this postcard while sitting on the beach, and then I mailed it off to Shauna the next morning. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to read through this postcard, and I want to see if you guys can read through the lines, read between the lines when I get to the ending here. Okay? Here we go. Hey, Shauna. How are you? I'm having quite the adventure on this vacation so far. We were in Springfield, Oregon this afternoon, and Dad locked his keys in our van. (laughs) Then he accidentally smashed in our whole back window trying to get them out. (laughs) So it's been a loud, windy drive so far. (laughs) Please tell your dad we saw lots of elk. But we finally got to our hotel here, and it's really cool. Right now, I'm writing this to you from under the big rock on the picture on the front. I actually put a stick figure of myself there with an arrow so she could really, you know, get a vivid picture of what I was doing. When I'm done, I'll read Wuthering Heights. It's so beautiful here. I wish you could see it in person. So I'm going to pause right here because I am getting to the end of the letter, to just the polite, conventional ending. And I remember sitting under that rock 
as a 16-year-old boy with hormones coursing through every vein of my body, just agonizing over what I should write here. I mean, it, in my mind, this postcard was much more than just a postcard. This was an opportunity to kind of move things forward in our relationship. You know, to drop a hint to Sean about the way that I really felt to tantalize her with an affectionate conclusion that would leave her longing for me to return to Washington State. <laughs> so, I took a bit of a risk. Here are the final lines of the postcard. Well, I'll see you soon. Stay out of trouble and say hi to your family for me. Love, Nate Corley. Did you catch the subtext there? <laughs> Can you see even now this molten four-letter word that is sizzling at the bottom of the postcard? Because this definitely was not lost on Shauna at, at, at the time. See, cause I, I'd sent Shauna notes before, not postcards, but, you know, we would pass notes between classes and a little folded-up piece of paper and stuff I'd hand her in the hallway. The kids here are like, what? This was before text messaging. So we actually wrote them on notebook paper and, and handed them to each other. And I, I had never ended any of those notes with such daring, blatantly romantic language. You know, dash Nate, that was my go-to conclusion on all of those. The same way I ended all the notes that I would like send to my sister, you know, saying dinner was in the fridge or something, dash Nate. But this time, there was no dash. Instead, there was love. Love, Nate. And Shauna and I were talking about this and laughing about it a little bit this week when she dug this postcard out of her scrapbook. And she said that she vividly remembers her 15-year-old heart skipping a beat when she got to the conclusion here. She said that she read the ending over and over and over again. And you can actually see the holes right here and right here where she pinned this postcard up on the bulletin board in her bedroom. Just so she could see it all summer long. Love, Nate. Oh, yes. This was much, much more than just a polite, conventional ending to a letter. The author intended it. The reader understood it. There was depth in those two words that you never would have guessed if you were just some casual outside observer who happened to, you know, glance over this postcard. What I have come to realize is I think the same sort of thing is going on right here at the end of the letter of 1 Peter. Because yes, this is a pretty polite, conventional way to end a letter, but it's also much, much more than that. What Peter intended and what I think his original readers would have understood is that this ending to the letter is actually a resounding summary of everything that he's covered in the letter so far. Peter's trying to do a lot in, in these three little verses we're looking at today. He wants to remind his readers of the key themes of the letter, and he wants to exhort them one last time to stand in them, to, to embrace the truth about Jesus with all of their hearts and to live their lives on that foundation. And he does so with a style, a precision, a beauty, and, and a brevity that really makes postcard writers like me drool with envy. This is why we're going to spend so much time in these three little verses today. Uh, we've already spent half the year in the letter as it is, and all of that study that we've done since January, it, it's going to serve as the foundation for what we do today. And what I hope is that the same way that Shauna was thrilled by my postcard 12 years ago, is the way that we'll all be thrilled by Peter's conclusion here today. My hope is that this conclusion will remind all of us of the depth and the richness of God's grace that will be inspired to, you know, pin it to our bulletin board, as it were, and that from this grace we'll find peace, true peace, peace that just propels all of us out the door this afternoon rejoicing in the King who loves us. So let's get started. Right here in verse 12. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So there are two clues in these concluding verses that should tip us off to the fact that Peter's doing more than just giving us a polite, conventional goodbye here. And the first one is right here in verse 12, where Peter does something a little bit out of the ordinary. It's a departure from convention, is how I put it in, in your notes there. Because remember, all Roman letters, they tended to follow the same basic formula. And Peter starts out following that formula, and then at the end of this verse, kind of takes a left turn out of it. 
Part of that formula was given a shout out to whoever it was who actually did the carrying of the letter for you to its destination. And Peter follows that here, just like you'd expect. In this case, the letter carrier is Silvanus, a guy that you probably know better by the Greek form of his name, which is Silas. Sound familiar? And, and yes, there really is a good chance that this guy, Silvanus, was the Silas that we know from the book of Acts, Paul's companion in all of those adventures early on. Could be a different Silas, of course, but really not a big deal in the end. S Silas, Silvanus, is the guy carrying the letter for him, so Peter says thank you here. He also gives this tactful instruction there to treat Silas well. You know, he's saying, he's a faithful brother in my estimation, so give this guy honor. Make sure you treat him well. And then... Peter summarizes the two purposes for the letter he just wrote, exhorting and declaring. Do you see those two words in the middle of the verse there? And really, what you could do is you could divide all of the content of the letter of 1 Peter into those two categories, exhorting and declaring, instructing and teaching, commands and doctrine. That is what the meat of the letter is. And that first category, exhorting... Uh, you could probably better translate that as encouraging or urging. Um, it's, it's more of a positive, motivating word than a negative one. The same Greek word can actually mean comfort, and that, that kind of captures the flavor of Peter's instructions in this letter a little bit better. The second category, declaring, could also be translated as testifying or witnessing. It's, it's a courtroom word, you know, the same thing that you would expect a, murder, a, a witness in a murder case to do, to, to testify to what they've seen, what they know to be true, and then declare it to the jury. And that's exactly what Peter does in this letter. He raises his hand, he takes the oath, and he delivers his testimony about who Jesus is. So remember, Jesus, I mean, Peter knew Jesus really, really well. He lived with him for three years, talked with him face to face, touched his resurrected hands, watched him ascend into heaven. Peter is a highly qualified witness, and this letter was Peter's way of declaring what we need to know about him. And just in case you were wondering, yes, it's all true. That's the point that Peter's making with that statement at the end of verse 12 there. This is the true grace of God. And this, that word this there, that refers to the letter as a whole. All of the instructions, all of the doctrine that we've been studying here since January. And it's all true, Peter says. Every single word, every promise in here is the true grace of God. You can bank on it. In fact, not just bank on it, stand on it. That's, that is the primary command in these three verses today, right at the end of verse 12. This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And really, that is the part of this verse that's a little bit unexpected. Told you that there was a departure from convention here. This is the left turn. This is that departure from convention. Because the time for commands came earlier in the letter. The conclusion was usually for pleasantries. That's the format that Roman letters at this time usually followed. But right here in Peter's conclusion, we've got a command. I have no doubt that Peter's original readers, they would have noticed this command here in the conclusion. It kind of stands out. We should notice it too. So, what exactly is Peter telling us to do here? Well, first of all, I should say, it's pretty obvious this is not literal. He doesn't want them to roll up the letter and, you know, put their feet on it or whatever. What, what, people's, what, what Peter's asking these people to do is take the truth of this letter, all of the doctrine, all of the instruction, and make it the firm foundation of their lives. You know, so often we get the opposite sort of thing at the end of letters, especially from letters that are delivering us news that seems too good to be true. For example, I, I got this big envelope in the mail the other day. Next day, verified fast-track mail, secured envelope. I mean, this is obviously a really important document that had to be rushed to me right away. And it was because it was telling me that I had won either $100,000 cash or a matching pair of his and hers Nith Nissan Pathfinders. That's pretty awesome. You know, it's... It's good to have a pair because then you always have a pathfinder that matches your shoe color that day. And I was, you know, obviously this is pretty amazing news. And until I get to the end of the letter here, where there is uh, a lot of four-point font that says, uh, dealer not responsible for mistakenly awarded prizes. Typos, void all winnings. Overall odds of winning, one 
in five million. <laughs> that is what you expect at the end of a letter that makes a bunch of cool promises. Am I right? You know, I mean, nobody, a, a Nissan, Nissan Pathfinder's 100 grand cash, nobody receives letters in the mail with unqualified promises like that. You know, so maybe as you're reading th through the letter of 1 Peter, you would expect a similar sort of statement right here at the end. Because Peter promises some pretty amazing stuff in this letter. He promises things that make a hundred grand in those Nissan Pathfinders seem like chump change, you know? Peter promises us a living hope. He promises us an eternal inheritance from Jesus that's more precious than gold or, for, or anything else. He promises stuff like eternal joy, eternal happiness, eternal peace and fellowship in the presence of God forever, not to mention complete and unconditional forgiveness of anything bad we've ever done. All just for trusting in Jesus. He makes stuff that, you know, would make anyone a skeptic. Really, the, the promises he makes. Stuff that just makes your jaw drop. But praise be to God, there is no fine print at the end of this letter from 1 Peter. Instead, you find the opposite. Really, in as big of a font as Peter can write, he says, This is true. All of it. 100% stand on it. That's Peter's instruction here. So that's the first way that we see that this polite conclusion is more than just a polite conclusion. Peter de departs from convention. He inserts this command. The second way that we know that something pretty big is going on in these three little verses is by Peter's use of a nifty little literary device. It is labeled as repetition in your notes there, but it is a uh, a, a snazzy form of repetition known as inclusio. Has anyone ever heard of inclusio before? Kind of sounds like something you could put into a Christian rap song, right? Includes what? Includes yo. That's what. <laughs> well, as far as I know, no one's done that yet. A missed opportunity. Anyways, what inclusio actually is, is the repetition of key words or themes at the beginning and at the end of a letter kind of like, like bookends, okay? This is a very common technique back in Peter's day. Believe it or not, literary sophisticates still do this today. For example, all you ladies out there who were 15, uh, maybe six, six or seven years ago, you'll remember that Taylor Swift uses this technique in her song, Love Story. I know those of you who are that age then know all the lyrics, but I'll say them again. The song begins with the line, we were both young when I first saw you. Then it goes through the whole rest of the song without repeating that line again. And then at the very end, the last line of the song, we were both young when I first saw you. That is an inclusio. When you bracket your piece of literature with the same words or the same themes as bookends. All right? I can tell by your faces, most of you never knew that little Taylor Tot had that much literary sophistication. She does, and, and so does Peter. Because if you look at the side-by-side -side comparison on the screen here, you'll see that the first two verses of Peter's letter, his greeting, and the last three verses, his conclusion, they have quite a bit in common. In fact, there are four specific themes that Peter highlights at the beginning and at the end to frame his letter with an inclusio. These themes are exile, election, grace, and peace each of which are color-coded in the, in the copies of the verses on the screen there. And the reason Peter puts these themes so prominently on each end of the letter is because they're super important for the letter as a whole. So, in fact, you could say that this whole meaty middle part of the Christian, all of Peter's, uh, or meaty part of the letter, all of Peter's exhortation, declaration, they are, they are elaborations of what these four themes really mean, the significance they ought to have in the life of a Christian. So what we're going to do here for the last half of the sermon is we're going to look at these four themes in two pairs, starting with the two themes that we see in verse 13. So I'll read that now. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with a kiss of love. So there's, there's probably three things in these verses here that need a bit more explanation before I get to the themes. So I'll start with the last of those three, which is greet one another with a kiss of love. Greet one another with a kiss of love. How many of you have ever quoted that verse to your youth pastor when he caught you doing kissy face in the back of the church bus? Only Earl. Okay. Well, uh, 
that's good because that is actually not the primary meaning of this verse. Okay? It's, it's easy to forget sometimes, but the New Testament, primarily an Eastern document written for people in Eastern cultures. And ancient people, Eastern people at this time did not have the same taboos that we have about kissing. For us in the U.S. right now, kissing is primarily reserved for your spouse, right? Or your dog, if you're, you're some of those people. I know that we have those people in our church, too. So, anyways, you usually don't kiss your friends, or definitely not your acquaintances, people you just kind of see at church once a week, or something like that. Well, people in Peter's day didn't really see things that way. The, the kind of kissing that Peter's talking about here is not romantic or sexual in any way. It's the warm friendly family greeting that you'd share with all your family members, all your close friends. And right here, Peter tells, this, tells the, the churches that he's writing to, to share this greeting with one another. It's actually pretty cool when you think about it, because what, what Peter's highlighting here is what he's already emphasized earlier in the letter, and that's the church is a family. We're brothers and we are sisters because we've all been adopted by God, our Father, through Jesus, and we've been reborn into this big, crazy family, you see, sitting around here right now. A family with, you know, rich people, poor people, Jews and Greeks, and slaves and masters. We're all living as equals before God and kissing each other as equals in a family. So that's the first reminder here. The church is a family, so really we should act like one. Second thing that needs to be explained is who that guy Mark is at the end of verse 13. And it's, it's almost certain that Peter's referring to John Mark here. That's the young guy who kind of ditched on Paul and Barnabas in the book of Acts. You guys remember that story. Church tradition, that Mark, church tradition tells us that Mark went on to be Peter's secretary and his companion. There's, there's a good chance that he may have been the one who, who penned this letter while Peter dictated to him or whatever. That's why Peter calls him his son here, not because Mark is Peter's literal son. That's very unlikely. But because he has this warm father-son type relationship with him. Church tradition also tells us that this guy Mark went on to write the gospel of Mark that we have in our Bibles based on Peter's eyewitness memories of Jesus. So that just kind of underscores again how close these two guys were. So Mark gets a shout out, just another example of a perfectly normal, polite thing you'd expect at the end of a Roman letter. And Peter also gives a shout out from she who is at Babylon which is the third thing that needs explaining in this verse. There's a little bit more debate among biblical scholars over who Peter's actually talking about here. Some people have speculated that Peter's talking about an actual woman, like maybe his wife or something, but uh, most people today don't believe that. Most people think, and I would agree with them, that Peter's using this phrase figuratively to refer to the church in Rome at the time. Babylon became a really popular nickname for the city of Rome among Jews and Christians at this time because just like the ancient city of Babylon in the Old Testament, Rome was this, this big, wealthy, pagan city that used its power to oppress the people of God. So what Peter's probably saying here by referring to the, giving this greeting from she who is at Babylon is saying, hey, I'm not writing this letter as just a solo apostle here. It's not just a letter from Peter, okay? I'm part of a local Christian community too, and that local Christian community sends their greetings. This is another thing that's really cool when you think about it, and it's something we've kind of lost to a large extent in our American culture. My friend uh, Russ Glessner told me the other day on the phone how Christians from other countries, Christians who are uh, people he knows from Scotland or India or all over the place, seem much more likely to do exactly what Peter does here to send greetings from their local church whenever they're conversing with Christians from another area. Christians from the U.S., though, hardly ever do this. You know, when, when was the last time you included in your, your Christmas card a little greeting from all your friends at Fellowship Bible Church, too? You know, it's, we just don't do that. Probably never. Why? I think it's probably because we, it's part of our thinking. We always think of ourselves as individuals first, who happen to go to church, you know, individuals, then members of a, a church family. And it's really normal for Americans to think that way, but that doesn't mean that it's the best way. 
The most important thing about any Christian is that they are a part of God's family through Jesus. You know, there's, there's no such thing as a solo Christian. It just, it doesn't happen. If you're connected to Jesus, then whether you realize it or not, you are automatically and permanently connected to everyone else who's connected to Jesus. And, and it's really time that we started thinking of ourselves that way. So there you go. Greetings from the church. Greetings from Mark. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Just the sort of, sort of thing you'd expect at the end of the letter. But like I said earlier, Peter's doing a lot more than that here. Those two words that Peter uses to describe the church in this verse... Babylon and chosen actually form the second half of our inclusio. They give us those next two major themes we're going to look at today, which is our exile and God's choice. Babylon wasn't just some random world power that Peter chooses to pick on here. It was the place of exile. You know, Babylon was the place where the people of Israel were carried off as captives. And any person familiar with the Old Testament would immediately think of exile whenever they heard the word Babylon. And when they saw the, ch the word chosen here, they would probably also think of the Old Testament. They would think of the way that God chose Israel from all the peoples of the world to be his own, to be his vehicle through which God would make all things new. Exile and election. That's what Peter's emphasizing here, just like he did at the beginning of the book. It's an inclusio. Remember, a book in structure. So look back at verse 1 of the letter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are, two words, elect exiles. Elect exiles, a.k.a. chosen Babylonians. Those who are in a very tough place, but also those who are deeply, dearly, and permanently loved by God. It's really the significance of these terms. And, and that's what Peter wants to emphasize right here at the end of the letter. It's that the life of a Christian is the life of a chosen exile. Because being in exile, it, it means that you don't belong. Being in exile means that life is more difficult for you than it is for those around you. Being in exile means that you speak differently, that you think differently, you have a different system of value than everyone else around you. And usually, being in exile, it means that you're rejected for all of that. But it doesn't mean that you're alone. We're in this together. That, that's what Peter's greeting is getting at with this, you know, greeting from she who's at Babylon. He's reminding all these scattered, persecuted, harassed Christian communities that he's writing to in Turkey that they aren't the only ones who are facing this fiery trial as he calls it earlier in the letter. They, are, they aren't the only ones in exile. The church in Rome is in exile too. They're in Babylon, just like the church in Philippi and the church in Jerusalem, the church right here in Tacoma, believe it or not. All Christians everywhere, in every country, in every locale, are people of exile, people who are on a pilgrimage to their real home. And it really, it, it helps to remember this. This is one of the important roles that the Bible plays in the Christian life is to help to break us out of our self-focused pity parties that we can get in sometimes. You know, like, oh, woe is us. We've got leaders that don't care about us in government. We've got laws that contradict our beliefs. And more and more of our neighbors think that we're weirdos and that we're idiots for putting all of our hope in this crucified Galilean peasant from 2,000 years ago. Well, that stuff is difficult, but... We aren't the first Christians to face opposition like that. In fact, most Christians and mo many Christians around the world right now are facing much, much worse. What Peter reminds us here is that even though we're in exile, we're never alone. Our brothers and our sisters around the world and throughout history are suffering with us and us with them. This is what, what Peter says just straight up, just a couple verses before this, verse 9, which, which Bruce preached on last week. He says, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You're not alone. Peter wants us to know that, so hang in there. Your brothers and your sisters are with you. And so is God. That's where Peter goes with this second key word, chosen. And not just chosen, likewise chosen, co-chosen, he says. All Christians are exiles. All Christians are chosen. It's two things we'll always have in common. 
And the reason that Peter wants to emphasize this theme here is really <laughs> it balances some of the scariness of being in exile. Yes, we are not at home. Yes, we're going to face all sorts of hostility and, and opposition from people who don't know Jesus. But if your sins are forgiven, if you're part of God's family, then you didn't get there on your own. God chose you. And if you didn't get there by your own power, then praise be to God, it's not up to your own power to keep you there. You got in by grace, you stay in by grace. This should be an enormous comfort to Christians who are under pressure. Because, and really that's why Peter makes this such a big part of the framework of his letter. He's saying, fear not, Christians. Remember, if, if you've been chosen by God, then nothing can take you away from him. Nothing. Not tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or sword. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors, not through our own strength, but through the strength of him who loves us. Take heart, Peter says. You've been chosen by God, and God is faithful to see you through the flames. So that's the first pair of things that Peter highlights at the beginning and the end of the book. Our exile, God's choice. The next two that he highlights also go together just like peanut butter and jelly. God's grace and our peace. Remember these two things from, from Peter's opening in the letter? Verse 2, chapter 1, he says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And then right here at the end, grace in verse 13, and then the final sentence of the letter, peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. What sweet, sweet words are those. Grace and peace. Those, those are the two final notes of Peter's symphony. Those are the the, the, the sounds that he wants ringing in our ears as we walk out the door today. And that's what I want to leave us all with today, too. Because if what Peter says in this letter is really true, if all of his exhorting, all of his declaring really is based on fact, then Christians should be the most peace-filled people on the planet because our God is the most grace-filled God in existence. And this isn't just some kind of vague, feel-goody, abstract peace that we're talking about here because it's not some vague, feel-goody, abstract kind of grace that we're dealing with. God's grace, according to what Peter says in this letter, is very practical. God's grace includes all of the things that he has already accomplished through Jesus and he freely gives to anyone who trusts in him. Those who are in Christ, as, as Peter puts it in this verse. So peace is is simply what you experience when you recognize this, when you realize what Jesus has done and what it means for you right now. So kind of in, in an attempt to make this less abstract for all of us and more immediate, you'll see you've got a list on the back of your notes there. And there's blanks for you to fill in on the first part of each sentence, all right? Those blanks are the grace half of this equation. They refer to the stuff that Jesus has accomplished and God has promised to do for his people. Then the second half of the sentence is the peace that should follow. The complete and total confidence that ought to characterize the life of those people who have trusted in Jesus. And that order in, in the list, that's important. Grace first, peace second. Because real peace, real peace isn't something that you can cram into your life through force of will, you know, like doing Tai Chi poses all morning or uh, listening to Simon and Garfunkel barefoot on your lawn in the moonlight, you know. That, that might make you feel peaceful for a while. In fact, it probably would, but it will be nothing more than an illusion. True peace only comes from God because true peace is only based on his grace, what Jesus has done and what Jesus will do for us. It's, it's very, very easy to have a peace problem and not really realize it. Because worry is a symptom of a heart that's not at peace. That's definitely one of them. But so is irritation. So is greed or envy or despair, bitterness. All of those sinful attitudes reflect the frustration of a person who is striving to achieve things for themselves that they can never actually earn. But the heart at peace, it's, it's just the opposite of all those. 
The heart of, at peace is a heart that has tasted God's grace. A heart that, that recognizes how God freely gives to us all those things that we could never earn and that he gives them as a gift through Jesus. Peace is the state of a heart at rest. At rest in God's grace. This is why we need letters like 1 Peter. We, we need them. We need Peter to remind us of God's grace so that we can know God's peace. So right now, go ahead, flip over your notes, get your pens out, get ready to write. If you don't have a pen, look at the chairs in front of you. There might be uh, some on the back there. I went easy on you in the front half of the notes. There were no blanks to fill in. We are more than making up for it here on the back. You'll also see that after each of these things, there are some scripture references in parentheses. And the reason those are there is to show you that they aren't just, you know, random examples of God's grace that I kind of pulled out of thin air and put on your notes. Each item on this list is a specific aspect of God's grace that Peter highlights in the letter. And there's a lot of grace in this letter, so there's a lot of things on the list. Let's get writing. First on the list, our inheritance. This is a huge theme in 1 Peter. According to Peter, if, if you belong to Jesus, then you've been reborn into God's family. And as part of that family, we qualify for the family inheritance. <laughs> so, so we don't need to worry about money now or, or fame or success or any of that other stuff that our, that our culture values so highly. Jesus has a glorious future waiting for all of us so we can rest in his riches, the riches of Jesus, because one day those riches will be ours too. This is what peace looks like. Peace even when your bank account is empty. Next on the list is judgment. Judgment is God's grace. According to Peter, Jesus will set all wrongs right one day. No wicked person will go unpunished. No wicked deed will go uncorrected. So we don't have to worry about stuff like revenge or bitterness or, or any of that stuff. Instead, we can rest in God's justice. This is what peace with our enemies looks like. Peace even when we've been wronged. Fellowship is next on the list. According to Peter, God has welcomed us into a community of mutual love and mutual submission. So we don't have to be worried about, you know, being rejected or judged by our fellow Christians. Those, those verbs really have no place in a, in a fellow family of sinners. Instead, we can rest in our relationships knowing that we stand as equals in the grace of Jesus. This is what peace in our church communities looks like. Peace, even when we're so very different from each other and step on our toes, step on each other's toes quite a bit. Next on the list, security. According to Peter, Jesus is the cornerstone of the Christian community. So we don't have to worry about the church crumbling under all the pressure of society around us. You know, we don't have to worry if there are going to be any Christians left in 50 years or 500 years. Instead, we can rest in Jesus' faithfulness knowing that the church only falls if Jesus falls. That's not going to happen. So that's what peace in our future looks like. Peace even when the opposition gets stronger and stronger because Jesus is always stronger still. And then purpose. According to Peter, God has given us a mission. So we don't have to worry about our, our direction in life or go away to a cabin, you know, for 18 months or something to try to find ourselves. Instead, we can rest in God's guidance knowing that our primary mission is to share the hope of Jesus with a needy world, and that's something that we can do anytime, anywhere, in any circumstance. That's what peace with our direction looks like. Peace even when you might feel totally lost. Then empowerment. God doesn't just give us this mission and then leave us on our own. According to Peter, God gives us his very presence through the Holy Spirit to energize and sustain us in the work that we have to do. So we don't have to worry about the task being too big, you know, or our talents being too small. God gives us his spirit so we can rest in his power, not in our power. That's, that's what peace with our purpose feels like. Peace, even when you might feel too weak on your own. Then protection. According to Peter, Jesus is watching out for us. He is our shepherd. He is our overseer. He is our guide. So we don't need to worry about the forces of chaos 
somehow throwing a wrench in God's plan. Jesus is protecting us so we can rest in his care. This is what peace in our circumstances looks like. Peace even when everything around us feels like it's falling apart. Next on the list, forgiveness. According to Peter, Jesus took all of our sins when he died on the cross. Every single one of them. So we don't have to worry about guilt or about shame or punishment from God. Jesus took all of that so that we can rest in his sacrifice, knowing that we are forgiven and we are free in the fullest sense of the word. This is what peace with our past looks like. Peace even when we've done terrible things. Next on the list is resurrection. According to Peter, and I love this one, Jesus didn't just die and stay dead. Jesus is alive. He, he's, you know, Peter saw the empty tomb. He held the grave clothes. He had a fish fry with the risen Jesus. So we don't have to worry about dying anymore. Instead, we can rest. We can rest in Jesus' victory over death because that is our victory too. That is what peace with our future looks like. Peace even when we're dying. And then finally, sovereignty. One of the clearest points in this letter is that Jesus not only died, Jesus not only is alive, but Jesus is king. The king. The king of everything. Every throne, every power, every ruler, every authority has been made subject to Jesus, and they answer to him. So we don't have to worry about hostile government leaders or terrible presidents or even Satan himself, the roaring lion who wants to devour us. Jesus is king of everything, so we don't have to worry about anything. This is what peace looks like. Peace based on God's grace. Peace to all of you who are in Christ Jesus. It's quite the list, isn't it? (laughs) And here's the craziest part. It's not exhaustive. It's not. The stuff that Peter describes in this letter is still only scratching the surface of the infinite grace that God offers in Jesus and the infinite peace that can be ours as a result even when we're under pressure. Peace under pressure. Some have said that you can actually summarize the whole letter of 1 Peter with those words. Peace under pressure. Even though we're exiles, we're not outside the ruling power of our king, the king of everything. So I'm going to close this sermon with the final promise, the final command of the letter, This is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Pray with me, please. Father, as I read over that list again of of the things that you've accomplished for us in Jesus, I'm just amazed at your care for us. I'm amazed at the lengths that you were willing to go to bring us to yourself. Father, forgive us when we forget it and, and, we, and we live lives of worry or frustration or despair when we have such amazing grace that we just overlook sometimes. I pray that by your spirit you would keep these things fresh as the foundation of our hearts so that we can live lives of joy and freedom that show the world around us the amazing hope that can be found in your son Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.